Benjamin Dixon Show is only possible with listener support. Go to www.thebenjamindixonshow.com to register for our blog and join the Progressive Army. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Benjamin Dixon Show. I am your host, Benjamin Dixon. Today is Friday, October 25th, 2019. Thanks so much for joining us. I have a lot to cover and I have a lot of voicemails uh, that I want to play. But I have to I have to discuss two people who have been the ire (laughs) uh, or have been the on the receiving end of my ire um, this week. And well, they've done it again. Mark Zuckerberg and Tulsi Gabbard. Let's start with Mark Zuckerberg. Now, I was impressed with AOC and everyone in Congress who grilled Mark Zuckerberg. I was equally as um, satisfied with seeing that he is not smart. Um, I know this from personal experience that there are a lot of people who have businesses who are just had money. Right. They just they just had the right investors and they had the right the right moment. There are a lot of people who are first to market. And actually, the, the, the best position is to be second to market like Facebook was to learn from the mistakes of MySpace. But he's not a smart person. But I'm not going to relitigate what happened Wednesday. I would have done that yesterday, but I was locked out of the house. So I have to discuss it today. And today I read an article that Facebook and this is from Bloomberg dot com. Facebook is getting ready to launch a program that's going to pay publishers and allow curators, human curators, not algorithms, to select and curate news articles um, that would then uh, be featured on Facebook, uh, prominently featured, driving significant traffic and resources through ad revenue sharing programs to these sites. Okay, so today uh, the article from Bloomberg identified Breitbart News as one of the trusted news sources that Facebook is going to include in this program. Breitbart News, uh, who gave Ben Shapiro his start, who gave Milo Yiannopoulos his start, who uh, which has uh, an entire section simply called Black Crime, right? Um, that, that, you know, I don't even have to describe what Breitbart News is. You know, and we all know, but apparently Mark Zuckerberg doesn't know. Or he doesn't care. Now, here's the bottom line. And, and I I, I kind of have to cut this section short just because of some time constraints here. But I just want to get to the point. There is nothing progressive about Silicon Valley. There's nothing progressive, inherently progressive, if I were to be more precise, about Silicon Valley or the tech industry or tech bros. We can see this not only in their proximity to white supremacy through these media outlets, through their uh, through the prox- through, through their silencing of left leaning voices while coddling this narrative of conservative victimhood. When, in fact, conservatism has a privileged position in these media outlets. They absolutely do in the tech industry in general. Right. We see constantly see we constantly see this idea that the tech industry is somehow inherently progressive when, in fact, if you look at their economic desires, they want monopolies. They enjoy these tax breaks. They have no problem with having their own gilded age right there in Silicon Valley, where it's too expensive for even their employees to live there. And so they have to be bussed in from an hour away. They 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 want They want all of the spoils of capitalism without any of the real responsibility to society, except maybe let's legalize weed. And and therein lies the extent or the the magnitude of their progressiveness. And maybe there some of them are on the same side as uh, same sex marriage. But when it comes to economic policy, when it comes to white supremacy, when it comes to male supremacy, also known as the patriarchy, they will embrace it just like Facebook has embraced Breitbart. There is absolutely no way that you could look at Breitbart News and not see clearly that it is a white supremacist organization that engages in male supremacy as well as Christian supremacy. For the purposes of gaining political power to execute on those paradigms. And so the fact that Facebook is not surprising, it's not shocking. It is just part and parcel for who Mark Zuckerberg really is. He is a conservative who started a website because he was jaded about all the women who didn't like his cornball ass. And so he created a site for them to rate women. And then he found, oh, well, maybe I can make a successful business out of out of out of patriarchy. 
Maybe I can make a successful business out of, uh, uh, out of this thing that I stole from someone else. It wasn't even his original idea. A lot of that going on. Stephen asses. <laughs> but it's important because we have to understand the lay of the land in, of the future is pseudo progressiveness. That's actually a cover for conservatism, which is a good is as good of a place as any to segue into Tulsi Gabbard going on Fox News last night saying that she wanted more transparent. She wanted the impeachment proceedings to be transparent and fair, which is literally a right wing talking point, a right wing talking point used to support Donald Trump. When in fact, the impeachment proceedings are extremely transparent because there are 47 Republicans who are who are a part of this proceeding. And yet here is a Democratic candidate for president of the United States who is going on the conservative, the, the television equivalent of bright, bright news. In order to support the same and to deliver the same talking points as this as the white supremacist in chief, Donald Trump, the Republican nominee, the Republican president. And does nobody see the problem here? She is literally everything I said that she was going to be. In fact, as much as I hate to say it, as much as I hate to say it, and and, and, and people are going to get mad at me for saying this, she's proving Hillary Clinton to be right just in less than a week of that story breaking. I mean, this literally undermines the Democratic position, politically speaking, but it also gives cover to a man who dares America to defend itself. From threats that are domestic dares America to use the process of impeachment, the the, the constitutional process of impeachment to hold the president of the United States accountable, who who laughs in the face of the emoluments clause and, and calls it phony. She's defending a man who consistently is the the quintessential example of corruption. And yet she wants to get out there and grandstand on Hillary Clinton, who. Basically, I mean, did you see a, a couple of days ago she did a book tour and like, I think, what, 100 people showed up? But it's more important for her to keep you focused on Hillary Clinton than the man in the White House right now who's made upwards of $100 million since he's become president through taxpayer dollars. Like the, 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 the pent ultimate example of grifting. That's what she's supporting. She is proving herself. And, and now she's announced that she's no longer running for candidate uh, for Congress. Like most most people who run for president and they don't really have a chance to become president. They run two campaigns at once. She says she's not really running for Congress anymore. Uh, she, she's committed to her race for president. But so two things here. Number one, there's a good possibility she was never going to beat her primary opponent there in Hawaii. Right. And number two. This really I, I, I cannot I cannot ignore the possibility that this just this really does show her commitment, even though she's on, only at one percent, her commitment to this race. Tulsi, I, I want to say this and I'm, I'm going to move to the voicemails because this is voicemail Friday. Tulsi perfectly represents I tweeted this, but Tulsi perfectly represents this uh, this this leftist, this pseudo leftist side of American of the American political spectrum that that calls itself anti-establishment but constantly makes excuses and prevaricates for the Republican establishment. So in in essence they're only against the Democratic establishment. They're not they're not against the Republican establishment. They're against corruption only when it's Democratic corruption. But they say nothing about Republican and, ma- and a matter of fact, Tulsi Gabbard is making excuses for the Republican corruption that is smeared all in our faces every single day. They're against Wall Street until it's time for Tulsi to go to Wall Street. And she's been meeting with Wall Street executives preparing. It looks like she's preparing a fundraise from Wall Street executives. I mean, there is a side of the American left. I don't even think they're really leftists, but they just use it as a positioning tool uh, to give them cover to cover. It's like it's it's all the same thing. If you ask me, it, it, the, the, the way that tech bros cover themselves with um seeking you know the legalization of marijuana and supporting same-sex marriage and and those kind of easy social issues that should be a no-brainer for anyone who has a a a, a modicum of human decency but when it comes to critical things like economics the tech bros are going to always sign up for tax breaks when it comes to being anti-war people like tulsi gabbard and some of her fanboys are absolutely anti-war 
only anti certain types of war and they'll turn a blind eye to other types of war. They're anti American imperialism, but they have no problem with the with the resurgent uh, Russian imperialism like they're anti American intervention in Syria, but have said nothing whatsoever about Russia now assuming that role in northern Syria doing joint patrols with Turkey on the Syrian border. See, that's the problem. Like, like they will never really admit who they actually are, but we can call a tree by the fruit it bears. And we can tell a tree also by who they don't call out. And so what Tulsi is showing herself to be is really a conservative in her heart who likes to hide in the leftist movement underneath the auspices of being anti-war when in fact she's clearly not anti-war. She's just anti a certain types of American war. She's campaigning to be your commander in chief and nothing else. She's not standing on any other type of leftist progressive policies. She's turning a blind eye and prevaricating and actually just covering for Donald Trump's corruption on Fox News, pandering right wing talking points, undermining the legitimate process that is transparent and constitutionally ordained. That has been that is that has 47 Republicans involved in it right now. Yet she goes on Fox News and does this. So what am I saying? Ultimately, there's a there are there are conservatives who have been disguising themselves as leftists all this time. There are people who call themselves anti-war. They're not really anti-war. They're just anti certain types of war. And they're totally fine. They will turn a blind eye to every other type of war that ensues. Same thing like Tucker Carlson. He's anti-war only when it comes in terms of any any type of war that will cause an influx of immigration and asylum seekers. But other types of war, it's just like Donald Trump. He, he excuses he excuses uh, his his betrayal of the Kurds by saying, oh, we have to end all this endless war. But then turn around and put those same troops to guard the oil fields, which is literally what what this faction of the left, this fake left has been saying the entire intervention, quote unquote, intervention in Syria was all about. They said, didn't they tell us last year, two years ago, that the Syrian civil war was really a CIA operation that was meant to keep uh, to keep Syria from getting an oil pipeline through it? Remember, that was the explanation. But now what are they saying about the fact that Donald Trump, who they celebrated two weeks ago for pulling our troops out of northern Turkey, northern Syria, exposing our allies to ethnic cleansing, They celebrated that, but now they're saying nothing about the fact that Donald Trump has kept those same troops to protect oil, but not lives of our allies. This is what I'm saying. We have had so many people who have staked their ground. They have they have they have planted their feet in the leftist movement and they are anything but leftists. They are not progressive and they can do so because they have the talking points of anti-imperialism, but they're quite okay with imperialism. They just want to give us another empire a try. Right. And they are quite OK with with capitalism. They just don't want American capitalism, but they're totally OK. Like China's capitalism isn't, isn't really capitalism. They're all they all run together. They all run and they are all gathering and supporting Tulsi Gabbard, which makes perfect sense now because you realize Tulsi Gabbard is not even a progressive. So anyway, um, I have I don't often say I told you so on my show. But all I'm going to say is keep watching the news and my prediction about Tulsi Gabbard and her supporters is going to come true. Her supporters at a minimum, Tulsi, Tulsi, maybe, maybe not. Depends on how how the opportunity sits with her. But her supporters, you're going to find more of her supporters supporting Donald Trump in 2020 than you will find them supporting uh, Bernie Sanders. Voicemail, leave your message, and we'll respond live on air. Hello, Mr. Dixon. This is Avery Dorco from Central Maine. Your segment about Mayor Pete earlier in the week was really good, and I think it's really frustrating when people try to reduce all criticisms of Mayor Pete to, like, personal homophobia. Um, I've encountered this when I've tried to criticize Mayor Pete's, like, uh, positions on Chelsea Manning, which I've, I'm remembering correctly, he supports her ability to transition um, and everything, but it's just like he wants her to be incarcerated for being a whistleblower, um, which I disagree with. Um, and it's like personally frustrating to be told that I'm like homophobic because I have that 
criticism of uh, Mayor Pete. And I've definitely encountered that on Twitter from, like, random weird centrists before. Um, and I, like, your segment resonated a lot because I think it's really frustrating when, like, the corporate media tries to drive wedges between our communities. Um, we need to build bridges between communities and have uh, open and productive dialogue and not just, like, accuse each other of being homophobic or whatever, because um, that doesn't, like, but it, it's important to have those conversations when it's important, but when it's, like, this Pete Buttigieg stuff and their policy disagreements, that's not, like, the conversation that needs to be going on. It needs to be going about his policy. Um, so I just wanted to say I, like, super agreed with the statement uh, in the segment that you did earlier in the week. Show's great. Have a great day. Bye. Avery, thanks so much for your call. Um, yeah, so let's talk about it. Identity politics are important. They are. It is quite literally possible that people dislike Buttigieg because he's gay. Just like it's possible that people hated Don, uh, Barack Obama because he was black. But that should not allow us to... We can't allow centrists to weaponize identity or anybody for that matter, right? We we always blame centrists for weaponizing identity politics, but really everybody weaponizes identity politics. The right conservatives weaponize it even better than anyone else. As you can see, they're collecting their um, their infinity, the infinity gauntlet, all the infinity stones of cultural multiculturalism. They've got them a black white supremacist. They've got a Muslim white supremacist. They've got uh, an Asian white supremacist on their on their team. So, I mean, everybody weaponizes identity politics. And I think what we have to do is, uh, like you said, we have to be able to have these critiques without um, without giving them ammunition to use weaponized identity politics uh, against us. So what I mean is this and I'm actually going to say it two different times. And it's applicable in two totally different ways. But I firmly believe that at all, as much as it is humanly possible, never give the opposition ammunition to use against you. And if we know that they are masters of weaponizing identity politics, then we need to make sure that we dot every I and cross every T and make sure that what we say can never be weaponized against us. It doesn't always work. Sometimes they're going to find a way to do it anyway. Sometimes even me, like I, I, it's hard to follow my own advice. Um, but we, I think we should put in the effort because as we put in the effort, it actually makes us better allies, right? To be mindful of how we say what we say when we say it and be, to be mindful of how other people will um, uh, interpret it intentionally and um, unintentionally, right? Because as we, as we, are all becoming communicators, mass communicators through social media. How people interpret what we have to say is as important as what we say. So I think it's definitely worth the effort to go 10 extra miles to make sure that we don't say anything that can be weaponized against us because in that effort, we tend to become more, uh, we become become better allies, right? Um, that's why I work so diligently to not always fall into um, my natural propensity to be ableist. There are some key phrases that I've grown up with that I have to work to get rid of. And it's, it's a work right now, right? I'm, I'm a work in progress and I have good friends who surround me, who constantly remind me and, you know, they don't cancel me when I mess up, but they guide me. And I just think it's worth the effort. Now, um, the second way I want to say this is totally irrelevant to Buttigieg, uh, but more um, germane to the uh, primaries in general uh, in terms of not giving people ammunition to use against us. I, I think it is worth the effort for us as uh, progressives and leftists at this juncture. I could do a whole show on this. I'm just going to say this real quick and move on. At this juncture, I think it's critically important that we Bernie supporters intentionally be as kind as we possibly can because they weaponize our anger against us and it does nothing to win over anyone i think if we had an entire movement of kindness i don't mean this philosophically i don't mean this in mush you know l listen i am a person who i finally have come to terms with the fact that the center of what drives me is love, right? And as mushy as that sounds, 
it's not so much. It's a love that pushes action. It's a love of concern. It's a love of, you know, changing the system for the better. And um, so I'm not saying this in terms of anything mushy. I'm saying this in terms of action. This is how we beat these bastards, <laughs> right? Beat them with kindness. Beat them by making sure we dot every I and cross every T and don't get into any intentional fights that they can weaponize against us. Analogous to how they weaponize identity politics against us. And also, I must close this segment by saying identity politics absolutely matter. Um, just because, and I'm, I'm taking this from um, the programmatic uh, pragmatic progressive he has a podcast you should check him out he said this on Twitter yesterday just because identity politics can be weaponized against us doesn't take away from the validity of identity politics in general alright next caller hi Ben it's uh, Ryan from next door in South Carolina I just want to let you know that uh, I am here for the petty bring the petty man just bring it That that's one thing that I enjoy you bring into the show and uh, your retort and the way you just bring it. Um, keep it up. Uh, keep up the good work and the good fight. And every time you get petty, I will cheer in my car as I drive. So I appreciate it. Have a great day. <laughs> Ryan, I swear to God, man, I literally almost spit coffee all over my computer just now <laughs> because of that voicemail. It's my first time hearing that voicemail. Um, yeah, you know, hey, I, I'll do the best that I can. It 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 is enjoyable, man. I try I try to raise uh, rise above uh, above it all, and more m- more precisely, it's not that I think I'm a bigger person than being petty. It's that. I have made the mistake over and over again, and my friend Anoa gets frustrated with me. Uh, Wendy Muse, uh, she she quietly gets frustrated with me. I can tell. Um, but when I give people the benefit of the doubt, when I shouldn't, when I am quiet, when I shouldn't be, like because I always, I really got into this rut of not wanting to be the bigger platform, crapping on smaller platforms, and what has happened. Is that the smaller platforms that I didn't say anything about, not only were they problematic when they were small, but now because nobody challenged them or because I, you know, honestly, because I didn't do my part in challenging them, you know, um, they grew. And now they're large platforms with really crappy politics. And so that's really why I always, you know, I call it being petty. But honestly, it's it's a bloodbath out here. It, it is it is doggy dog world. And if we let people get away with spreading misinformation just for the sake of trying to be civil, then I have failed. At, um, I have failed at my job, not just as a commentator, but a person who's politically active. And I'm doing this for the purpose of movement journalism, right? Movement commentary. I'm not just doing this for shits and giggles. I'm doing this because we want to make a change. All right, we'll be back after this. Go to www.patreon.com forward slash the BPD show and support the Benjamin Dixon show. And as always, at this point in the show, I'd like to thank our newest patrons. You know, I probably should be more petty on, on a regular basis because you all just really showed out. I don't. OK, here we go. I'm just going to read them all. And yeah, there, there's a lot of them. Um, special thank you to Isaac for becoming a patron. Nick for becoming a patron Leo W for becoming a patron TJ thank you for becoming a patron Uh, Rebecca thank you for becoming a patron Brandon M thank you for becoming a patron Uh, Jason the Fisherman thank you for becoming a patron and Christian Shaw thank you for becoming a patron and I do believe someone else increased um, their pledge amount let me see if I can find that really quick Um, Patreon pledge yeah Kiefer Thank you for it. Ed- oh, I think I mentioned. No, Kiefer edited. Oh, wow. So hang on. Kiefer, you went from two dollars to ten dollars and then from ten dollars to twenty seven dollars. Wow. I missed that first movement, but thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for supporting the show the way that you do. Um, honestly, I'm at a juncture where your support is so critical to me being able to continue doing the show. And I um, can't stress enough how much every single dollar matters. And I I appreciate this is like, you know, this is like public funded radio, right? There are going to always be people 
who consume the content but simply do not have the money to give. And I respect that and I appreciate you for even listening, right? Um, but that's why the patrons become so important because you're not just you're not just providing you're not just sponsoring this so that you can hear it. You're literally helping other people hear the show. I um I am starting to accept the fact that my role in this national discourse is significant and important and worthwhile. And because of that, I feel I feel like your contribution, you know, you guys just y'all have just y'all just have ridden for me for so long. And it's just amazing that even now, after five years of doing this, we're just getting started and people are just realizing how important this show is. And people are are starting to realize like you already knew, but people are starting to realize how important my voice is to the conversation. And as uncomfortable as it is to even say that, it's because like, you know, I have to recognize that. Like the last caller, you know, the pettiness, the 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 analytical ability, but also the willingness to get into the fight and mix it up and and just go head to head. Like, you know, it's frustrating <laughs> and it has put a lot of years on me. If you saw the picture I tweeted on uh, Twitter and Instagram and on Facebook, I shared how young I looked just eight years ago, eight years ago, eight years of doing politics. I wrote my first book back in 2010, 2011 on politics. And ever since then, I've been engaged in like uh, hand to hand combat, uh, <laughs> combat in politics. But it has aged me significantly. And I only mention that because like this is a real this is a real thing, man. This is a real fight just to weed through the B.S., Especially when there are so many incentives for us to engage in the BS, to engage in the clickbait, to be hyper reductive. Okay, so anyway, thank you for being a patron. Let's get back to some voicemails. The show I am gonna the show's gonna run long today because there was a lot of stuff I wanted to say yesterday and I was locked out of the house. But in the meantime, voicemail. Hi, this is Jamie Miller from Indiana. And if we had Medicare for All, my life really wouldn't change all that much, except everyone would have what I have. See, I'm on disability, which means I'm eligible for Medicare now. Let me tell you guys something. It is great. Medicare saves lives and improves life quality. You're able to get the care and medication you need without worrying if your greedy insurance company is going to deny you. Or your meds will be too expensive to afford because of price-gouging pharmaceutical companies. Mm. Well, the only thing that would really change for me, personally, is that I wouldn't be stuck on disability to keep my Medicare. Right. And there's quite a bit I might be able to try if I didn't have to worry about that. Hey, thanks, man. Keep up the good work. Bye. Jamie, thanks so much for the call. That's the same Jamie Miller who up, upped her pledge uh, this week to $10 a month. Thank you. $10 a month is huge. Um, but thank you also for calling in specifically to discuss what you would do with your life if you had Medicare for all. And that's what I really wanted all the voicemails today to be about. A lot of people emailed. Um, a lot of people posted comments, and I'm going to read those as well. So we're going to do an entire segment. To, and, um I guess we might as well start now. But I like what she said. Right. If you consider like we have Medicaid. Right. And we do have Medicare. And and it really is a a fantastic system that is relentlessly under attack by Republicans, but one that we all could benefit from. And I, I really want to hear your stories. I want to I want to share your voices. A matter of fact, I I've actually I'm going to take something back. I'm not going to read what you wrote because I want people to hear it in your own voice. I want you to call in 857-600-0518 and leave a voicemail and I will feature a voicemail every single episode because I want us to start a dialogue nationally about what you would do if you had Medicare for all and then two, what you would do if your student loan debt was canceled. So if you're like me and you told Sally Mae to go to hell a long time ago, well, anyway, I'm not going to finish that sentence because they're, they're after me, but There are a lot of people who are diligently paying their student loans every month. What would you do if you had that money freed up? I mean, I know what I would do if I didn't have them calling me every day. (laughs) 
857-600-0518. Leave a voicemail. Tell us what you would do with your life or how would it, not just what you would dream about. I mean, tell me about your, like, what could you do if you weren't stuck on your job just because you needed health care? Right? I want to hear your voice and I want to share your voice. Here's another one. Hey, my name is Big Merce from North Carolina, a.k.a. Mr. Hyde's Wrath on Twitter. Um, I was a call earlier, so, but to answer your question from, uh, from your Twitter post, what would I do with my freedom without uh, student loan debt and uh, no fear of uh, going bankrupt over medical bills? Uh, very simple. I would just buy a nice old townhouse and just live happily ever after and not have to worry about the future so much. So I'm just going to keep it short and simple. Love the show. And uh, you have a great day. Yeah, I think I thank you so much for the call. I think people take it for granted, right? The the amount of freedom that you would have simply without I mean, listen, not only would we live longer because we would be able to go to the doctor and be able to get our medicine and be able to take care of ourselves before I mean, we would preventative care would be unbelievable. You know, one of the number one reasons black men in particular die so early is that we don't get care until it's almost too late. And, and and part of it is cultural fear, right? Fear that that um that that we're just afraid to go to the doctor. But a huge part of it that we really don't talk about that much is the cost. Some of the reason we're afraid to go to the afraid to go to the doctor is because of how much it costs us. We we realize some of these sicknesses are just going to cost us an arm and a leg. And then most of the time we won't even have money to pay for it. So just imagine how much longer we would all be living. The, the life expectancy in the United States would go up. The anxiety would go down. I mean, you listen, as as bad as things can get, you know, there there's still a level of comfort to be able to sit with a doctor and go over how you solve some of the problems that you may be having. So some, you know, it's just, it's, there's so many reasons I want to hear your voice. So as you become a patron, even if you don't become a patron, you know, call in 857-600-0518 and tell us what you would do if you were able to have Medicare for all and, or have all of your student loans canceled. It's important. I want to share those voices. All right, let's keep moving. I honestly didn't really have much more to say. I I started this. um, (laughs) I honestly am adding this segment just so that you could listen to that track. (laughs) But seriously, I want to give a couple of shout outs and two shows that I want you to 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 check out. Um, I am jealous of these two guys, Um, both of them for different reasons uh, and for the same reason. They're young. They're so young. I think Q may not even be 22 yet i know q is an undergrad and aj um he's an undergrad i know aj is 21 but there are two podcasts that i want you to check out um i don't agree with them all the time matter of fact i'm bringing q on next week and we're going to talk about china (laughs) so we're going to show you that we disagree but then we agree on so many other things um but go to soundcloud.com forward slash fragments pod that's our F-R-A-G-M-E-N-T-S pod. They're short. They're very short. They're like 15 minutes, 13 minutes, uh, six minutes. Um, Actually, 13 minutes is the longest one. But in that time, he gives you a really good primer into black radical politics. And I say this to anyone and everyone where black radicalism goes. So goes America, because black politics, black radicalism has always been on the front edge of progressivism and leftist policies in this country. So check out my homeboy Q over at Fragments Pod, uh, SoundCloud.com forward slash Fragments Pod. And I want you to check out this young cat named AJ. His show is pro- 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 <laughs> Pragmatic Progressive. It's quite the alliteration that is kind of difficult for me to say. But he gives these really long dives that are, um, I don't know, I was on his podcast twice. And I really, 
really enjoyed the conversations and his ability to pivot and ask questions and follow up questions and, and really get to the meat of the substance, like the substance of the matter. Um, so two totally different podcasts. You can go to youtube.com forward slash pragmatic progressive to get AJ's podcast and then go to uh, soundcloud.com forward slash fragments podcast. Uh, again, Q is going to be on the show with me next week. Uh, I probably will have AJ on the show sometime soon. Two young cats, undergrad, very impressive. I love their work. You should go check them out. Um, and that's it. Thanks so much, folks. Have a great weekend. I will see you next time. The Benjamin Dixon Show is only possible with listener support. Go to www.patreon.com forward slash the BPD show and support the Benjamin Dixon show. If you like this episode, be sure to share, like, and subscribe.